Holy Spirit. And mixed in there, we've had different things we've been, we've been bringing in, but it's all been dealing with that. And tonight, I'm going to do probably one more, but I'm going to talk a couple things that I want to share that I think are, that just been on my heart. One of them is that we need the power of God. And the world needs the power of God. And I need you to hear it like I'm saying it. We need the power of God, but we can't be consumers only. We have got to export the power of God to the world around us. That's one part. <clears throat> the other part that I want to share with you and, and get into just a little bit is the one thing that really moves the miraculous power of God or releases the miraculous power of God is compassion. And tied in with compassion, I think there is just a, a generality of, of talking about honor, of talking about just seeing people in the light of how God sees people and not seeing people as political or as whatever agenda they carry or as bad and good but just seeing people the way God sees people and sometimes that's hard to do and I think it cuts off a large amount of the flow of God in our life towards other people because of our judgments towards people our our perception of people and we can miss so much that God wants to do through us for people by carrying a wrong perception of them. Sometimes that wrong perception causes us to live in fear of them. Sometimes it causes us to live in just not liking them. Or it even gets to a place where God, uh, go ahead and let fire come on down on them. Right? <laughs> uh, there were a couple of disciples that tried to do that. They got so confident Jesus was teaching them. They were walking along with Jesus. And, and the Samaritans were kind of like tiffed at Jesus because Jesus wouldn't take time for them. So James and John turned to Jesus and said, Lord, we'll call fire down. You want us to call fire down from heaven? We'll fry them. Cook them right here at barbecue. And the one thing Jesus said to them, and at least I know in King James it says it this way, and it says it in the translation, Spanish translation, but it says, you don't know what spirit you're of. Your motivation is coming from the wrong spirit. And it's one of the things that we have got to really be careful of as we move through our walk with God is checking, letting God examine our motivations in the things that we do. And uh, to me, it's a big deal. And knowing what spirit you're of, right? Uh, and I want you to think about that for a second because when Peter, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus pulls the disciples aside and he says, who do men say that I am? And, and they all speak up and they say, well, some say you're the prophet Elijah. Some say you're the prophet Isaiah. Uh, some say Jeremiah. They say different things. And then Jesus gets more pointed and he says, who do you say that I am? You've been walking with me for these years now. Who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? And Peter screams out. He says, you're the Christ. The anointed one, the Messiah. You're the Christ. The Son of God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. And he goes on to speak about the revelation that just came out of the mouth of Peter. And, and, he, and, he, and he applauds him. He said, you received this from heaven. This is a revelation. And I'm going to build my church upon that revelation of who I am. Not who people think I am, but who I am. And that's, that's a big deal. But turn right around as you're reading in that scripture. It's in Matthew 16, 16. And you go on down a few verses. And I don't know if a week went by. I don't know if a day went by. I don't know if a month went by. Some time may have gone by. We don't know. But it's sandwiched together in the Word of God where in Matthew 16, 16, Peter has this tremendous revelation 
You know, sometimes your greatest revelations come out of a moment when your mind is not working right. It's like accidentally on purpose, it just slips out. And turn right around a few verses later, and Jesus starts talking to the disciples, not only about what they just had a conversation of, but he starts sharing with them and saying, uh, I'm going to die. He starts talking about the cross. He starts talking about what he's going to go through and starts preparing them for what's getting ready to come. And Peter, in all of his boldness and confidence, you see, when you think you're in the right spirit, sometimes you just need to back up for a second and hold off. Peter blurts out and says, No, that's never going to happen. We're not going to let that happen. We will fight and we will kill. And Jesus says, Peter, he doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Satan. Now you can't get any stronger than that, and you can't get any more direct than that for Jesus to say to Peter, Satan, get behind me. So was Peter Satan? Was he Satan incarnate? No. But he was moving from the wrong spirit. Now I'll tell you what that shows me. And it's not to scare you, but it is to put you in a place of understanding that there's many times we need to check the motivation, check the heart, because we can operate out of the wrong spirit just because we're in the wrong place. What I want you, what I want you to realize is we may think we're always hearing from God, and then there's that time that we're just not in the right spirit. And we're doing it the wrong way, the wrong motivation, coming from the wrong place, coming with the wrong, the wrong intent. It's one of the things, especially when I talk about the prophetic, is something I had to learn and continue to guard with all my heart. I never want to prophesy to people out of the wrong motive, the wrong heart. Because prophecy, especially what I do, I, I can speak for myself, uh, giving personal prophecy where God has used me tremendously all over the world can be very manipulative towards people. It can be very controlling, manipulative, because there is, there is a amount of you're bringing God to them and you're saying things to them and you can manipulate things very easily. And I've seen it happen. And it's what scares me about it uh, many times and why I draw back many times from giving the full intent of what God wants to do, sometimes because I err on the side of not doing it rather than making a mistake. And I've gone back and forth, and I'm getting more into the balanced area uh, more than ever in my life. But I, I don't know how many times, you know, like guys in Mexico, the leaders, we're going to be with them this next week. But they would say to me, said, why did you stop? And I'd say, well, Holy Spirit left the room, and, which was a lie. So I had to repent of that. Holy Spirit doesn't leave the room. <clears throat> I just didn't, I was afraid to go further. And I wouldn't face my fear. I was afraid to go further. I didn't want to miss God. And things like that. So uh, what I'm trying to say to you, there, there, there are, we've got to watch our heart because there are two different spirits we can operate out of. Even though we can operate out of the Spirit of God. You say, well, that was before the day of Pentecost. That was before Jesus rose from the dead. They were walking with Jesus. They were, salvation had already come, right? Uh, and I think it, it's not something we can just throw aside and say, well, that wasn't in the era of, era of grace. It was in the era of grace. It was already in that era of grace. Jesus was walking the earth. And, and, and it started at the cross specifically, but I think it started when Jesus started moving. And... Um, so we got, we got to watch that. You got to, you got to be careful because sometimes you can get very rambunctious. You can get very uh, going and, and feel very strong about something and coming from the wrong motive, coming from the wrong spirit. So <clears throat> on top of that, um, you want to operate out of a place of compassion. And compassion, and I may go ahead and give you some scripture about this. Let's just go ahead and look at Matthew 9. 
Maybe somebody could read that for me so I don't have to turn to it. Thirty-five through thirty-eight. It's going to be up on the screen. Come on. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Is there more? Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pause. Is that it? Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Um, yeah, actually, there's two, there's two points I want to make in there. 35, in verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease. I believe that those are the three-pronged uh, parts of the gospel, or of, of carrying out ministry. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every de disease and sickness. I think those three things, I, I prayed many years ago because there was a big move, and it probably still is, I don't know. I, I don't keep up with the fads. But there was a big thing that, you know, if you were a pastor of a church or anything, you had to come up with a theme for the year type thing or you had to have a vision for the church and it had to be in a succinct statement and I mean they give classes on this stuff they teach you how to come up with the vision statement and the, whatever all the, I don't even remember what it all was you remember that don't you and it was like man I must be a bad pastor because I can't come up with one and I would just seek the Lord and I say God what what is the vision what I don't know what the vision is because all my heart was to love people. All my heart was to have compassion on people. And people get saved. And if people get saved, they need help because they're all dirty and they need to get cleaned up. So you clean them up, right? You disciple them. And as you're discipling them, you've got to get them set free of stuff. And they've got broken families. So then the families get restoration because the power of God comes in. You get them spirit-filled spirit, spirit and, and, and repeat, Right? Reset, repeat. And it's like, Lord, what, what's the vision? And God gave me this scripture. And he told, he told me a long time ago, and it's never changed. I prayed about this several times because every once in a while I get into this place of, of, of <laughs> I got to be like the rest of them. I don't have this statement. And God always corrects me. He said, Richard, this is the vision. This is, this is what ministry is supposed to be about. This is what a church is supposed to be about. Teaching the Word of God, expounding upon the Word of God, explaining the Word of God so that we can take it practically and walk it out in our life so we can go home and raise our children so we can go out and touch the world around us. Teaching the Word of God, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, who Jesus is, the kingdom of God being established, understanding there's a new king in charge and all of this is taking place and, and that's the preaching, proclaiming, preaching the good news, preaching the power of God and then finally Finally, healing every disease and sickness. There isn't anything else. I used to be asked, and said, well, what, what is your church about? Is it like, are, are you guys, is your vision worship? No, we worship. But that's not like the end all. That's not like it. Well, is it healing? Um, yeah, we, we do that, but that's not our vision. Well, what's your vision? Well, everything God told us to do. Anyway, I won't harp on that. But, <clears throat> so those three areas. So Jesus is going around doing these three things. And do you see that he sa it says he's healing all the sick? Right? Do you see that? Healing every disease and sickness. Proclaiming the good news, teaching the synagogues. And then verse 36 says, When he saw the crowds. So he's, he's doing all this other stuff. But when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. 
So even in the midst of doing all that he was doing, he saw the crowds. And he was moved with compassion. Compassion rose up in the Son of God, rose up in him. And as compassion rose up, he, starts, he, sees, he sees their condition. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Sometimes I wonder, can we see the world around us that way? No matter who they are, I don't care where they are in the spectrum. I don't care if they're rich or poor. I don't care if they're, they're the most famous person or the not so famous person. I don't care who they are. Can we see the world around us that way to have compassion that they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd? I've been around people, we, we've gone different places, and I like, I love to go incognito. I think we were on a trip with you guys in, in Roatan. We went on this trip, and, and uh, we ended up, the four of us made friends with uh, one of the producers of the original movie Jaws. And it's like, surely this guy has got his life together. You've never heard so much drama before. And I mean, before the end of the week, this guy is, he's asking people for forgiveness. That wasn't in his vocabulary before that week started. And he was hearing things about God. And, you know, you look at him from the exterior, it's like, he's got money, he's got prestige. I mean, Jaws, come on, right? He's, I, I had to ask him, I said, well, tell me a story. I mean, I want to know a story behind the scenes story. So he did. He told me a story about the ship, the, the boat that they used that was sinking. They had a problem with it because it was sinking while they were filming. And it wasn't supposed to be. Anyway, that's just a side note. But the point I'm making is this guy looks like he's got it all together. He's got everything in life. What else could you want? He does whatever he wants to do. Family was broken, divorced. Lady that was with him is not his wife. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Problems after problems. So you've got to look beyond what you see and see like Jesus, but you have to have compassion to do that. Compassion is what moves God to perform miracles. And I have found compassion is by far the number one key to releasing the power of God through our lives. So here, here's the thing with compassion. And, and, I, and I'll, I may go to some other scriptures. But compassion will, will make you live beyond your need. Compassion will carry you when the provision is gone. Compassion will move on you no matter what the circumstances are around you. And compassion will bring miracles to wherever you are. So a lot of times, you know, we start the discussion talking about, I mean, I, I want the gifts of the Spirit in my life. And, and the first thing that we need to understand is, yeah, that's great. Let's, let's go after the gifts. And God even says, Paul says, I want you to go after. Go after the gifts. Desire the gifts. Get a hold of the gifts. God wants you to have them. God wants to move in our life with all that. And the next thing that starts happening with us is, as, as a group, and I'm not saying we do this, but I've seen this tends to happen, is we become a closed circuit, and we start having fun with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's like, man, I love this new toy. This is so cool. I want to go give a word to so-and-so and word to this one. And, and then they give me a word. And I, I've always, it's always been funny to me. That I'll get in certain places and, and God helps me to call out people. And then they come and say, well, I've got a word for you. And it's like, I don't want a word. I don't, I don't need a word. I don't want a word. You say, Richard, why do you, don't you want? I don't need a word. I don't need you to perform. I, I want God to work. I don't need people to perform and prove that they have a gift by trying to give me a word. That's fine. I'll, yeah, praise God. Thank you for the word. But I don't need the word to do what God's called me to do. I need more of God. That's fun getting a word, but I'm not motivated towards getting a word. Does that make sense? And <clears throat> so a lot of times what happens is we're 
we're getting in, and, and it's great to have that atmosphere, and, and we're cultivating that atmosphere here where we can give each other words. So don't take me the wrong way. I want that to happen. But what I'm saying with that is this. If that's where it stays forever, then we've missed it all. Because it's got to get to a place where compassion starts motivating us to reach out to other people. And then even though we don't want it, the gifts show up because they spill out because of compassion. I've been in so many circumstances like, I'm so tired. I don't want to, don't talk to me. Don't bother me. Don't sit next to me. And that's where they sit. Always. It's like right there. And you've heard, I've told stories. I mean, I've got a bunch of them. I mean, I get them all mixed up because I've got so many of them. I'm traveling and I'm tired. I understand where Jesus was at the well. I, I, just exhausted. I want to, a lot of times I would take my Bible on bus rides because bus rides were usually three hours or more. And sometimes it could be four or five if there was an accident. And uh, <clears throat> I'd take my Bible and I figure opening my Bible, people will leave me alone. And it worked until it didn't work. And then it was like this lady sits next to me and God told me, he said, I want you to give her a word. I want you to speak into her life. It wasn't even about giving her a prophecy. It was about speaking in her life. And, and we're in a bus station, thousands of people, hundreds of buses going in and out early morning and people line up to get on the bus and I see this lady and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to speak to her. And I said, God, that ain't going to happen. She's a woman, and I was very careful about that. So I didn't approach strange women, especially. She was gorgeous, so I'm very careful about that. It's like, nope, not doing it, not going that way. And uh, she's going to get on another bus anyway, so I'm free. I don't have to worry about it. Not going to happen. Sorry, God, I missed that one. But you got to do more than that. So she gets in the line for the bus I'm getting on. Out of 100 buses, she gets in my line. So I said, Holy Spirit, I ain't doing it. She's going to sit somewhere on the bus, but she's, she's not going to sit next to me, so I ain't, I ain't doing it. She's got to sit next to me because I ain't doing it any other way. So I get on the bus, and she was, you know, towards the back of the line. My seat stays empty. And uh, she gets on the bus and sits next to me. So I said, God, I know what you're trying to do here, but I ain't talking to her. So I took my Bible out and opened up my Bible. And I figured, this is going to turn her off. I'm going to be off the hook with the Holy Spirit. Because I told him, I said, unless she initiates, I ain't doing anything. So she initiates. Starts wanting to know what I'm reading. And it was just so much like the eunuch on his way to, <laughs> that, that Philip comes alongside and says, can you explain this to me? And it was like, oh, okay, God. I guess I'll have compassion now. And I had the compassion, but I was so tired. Does that make sense? God will, God will mess, you, mess with you and, and mess you up in the way because of compassion. And, 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 I've, and I've tried to love well. I don't always get it right. I, I've been, you know, that angry driver from time to time. Don't always get it right, you know, get in line and sometimes fighting through the crowds and, you know, you go to the grocery store and there's lines and you're trying to get over here and you get in the line that is the slowest line in the entire grocery store. So I haven't always got it right, but I've learned a little bit about loving people. And when you start letting compassion, compassion is a driving force. It's, it's something that, and what I want you to see, in, in, even in this scripture, is that Jesus didn't always operate at that level of compassion. He operated in ministry and did things, but every once in a while, compassion would just take him over, and he would m be motivated by compassion in his life, and he would do something extraordinary because of compassion. And I can take you to Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. Some of the greatest miracles that Jesus did was because compassion rose in his heart. I'm convinced that it is a key that God has given for the release of his power upon the earth. 
If we as a people can understand and learn more about compassion and being motivated, being moved by compassion, moved by that love, it's, 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 a, it's a selfish, selfless love. It's, it's giving up. Uh, you know, I, I started looking at this and thinking about it the other day, and I, I, I basically dragged my family all over the world. And if you were to ask me, so, so tell us about all the bad experiences. I have a hard time remembering them. Because compassion motivated me through the bad experiences to see the great, the extraordinary things in the Lord. And I really believe that compassion will wipe away the heartache. I believe it will wipe away the pain of suffering. I believe it wipes away the things that we go through in order to get to that place. Because when compassion motivates us, the power of God flows through us, there is nothing that can replace that. I'm telling you, nothing. I mean, salvation is great. But I, I, I would almost say the feeling of seeing God or having God use you in that moment towards people is greater. Maybe I could say the emotion of it is greater. I don't know. I don't want to minimize the importance of salvation. But my salvation experience was, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. But when I started moving in compassion and, and miracles started place, taking place, it's like I'm just in tears. I'm just broken. I'm just, I'm just like, God, you just did that. I didn't know it really worked. I mean, I know it's in your word, and I know I was supposed to say it, but I didn't know it would work. But I was out of compassion, I couldn't not do it. Out of compassion, I couldn't hold back and, and not take the chance. I couldn't not pray. Out of compassion, I just started doing it. And <clears throat> it's like I, I, just, I just learned at some point, if I just love people, God will love them through me. And, and His healing virtue will flow. His power will flow. Words will flow. Discernment will flow. But when we start turning this into just a game, or turning it into just, I want to learn, just, I want more from God, which is all, it's a good thing, I want more from God. But when we turn it into that, rather than moving out of compassion towards a, lo a lost world around us, we start missing it in the long run. And I think that's the kind of thing that Paul talks about at one point. He said in the book of Corinthians, he said, I don't want to have preached to the whole world and lose my own soul. So you can still do the preaching and do all that stuff. You can still do it all. But when I, I'm saying when compassion's missing, the motives may be wrong. We may be doing it for the wrong reasons. And I don't ever want to do that. I mean, I can, there's a lot better ways I can figure to suffer through life than to do ministry without God. Well, you can think of it that way. Yeah, very true. So, <clears throat> as we go through, like even the life of Jesus, I can give you, without reading all the scriptures, uh, Jesus was moved by compassion when he fed the 5,000. Tremendous miracle. He was moved with compassion uh, through several times of healing people. Matthew 14, 1. Matthew 20, 30, Mark 1, 41, all healings that took place moved by the compassion of Jesus Christ. He was moved with compassion to free people from de demons in Mark uh, 5, 19. <clears throat> Raising the dead, 
Luke 7, verse 11 through 15. And it goes on and on. Uh, the life of Paul in the book of Acts, chapter 17, 16, he, he would, one of the customs that Paul had is he would get acquainted with the areas he would go into because he didn't know them. So he would go there and he'd get acquainted with what the area was like. And in one place it talks, in, in that place it talks about as he walked around, he saw the idolatry and he was gripped by compassion. Because of all that he saw in a city and he had to preach. He was waiting on his um, team to get there. He went ahead of the team, kind of like checking out the land, right? And his team stayed behind to take care of some things. And he, while he was waiting for them to catch up, he couldn't wait because compassion gripped him and he had to preach. He couldn't hold it back. And I find that over and over again, and, I, and I've said this already, but over and over again, if we start finding the motivation of compassion in our life towards people, it won't, it won't matter if you're tired. It won't matter if you're hungry. It won't matter if you've missed uh, sleep or if you're, you've had a problem. None of that will matter. Not even a flat tire or, or a breakdown will matter because God will have an opportunity for compassion to rise up and touch somebody's life in the midst of that. And there may be a miracle of provision for you on top of it. It's, it we, we've got to check the motivation. We've got to check what's going on in our hearts. Does that make sense? And, and, and look at being motivated by compassion. And, and I wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit just to, to let you know how important it is that we don't get caught up in just talking about the beauty of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're beautiful and I embrace them big time. That's why I teach on them. That's why I allow them in our church. I want freedom of the Holy Spirit in our body. I want us to learn. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a baby turning into a toddler, turning into an adolescent, turning into a young adult, turning into an adult among us. And we've got to nurture that. We've got to raise everybody into the giftings of the Holy Spirit. The sooner we can start doing it, the better off we are. Because I don't want a bunch of old, cranky Christians that have never experienced the power of God for themselves. Yeah. I am finding, even in parenting, with how do you spend enough time with a person that is, goes against everything you believe in and you're following and you are trying to set yourself away from the influence of other things, but they also need the compassion and they need Jesus because clearly you're going to need Jesus. So how, how do you do that? So there's a real practical side of that, and, and one, of, one of them, I'll try to just give pieces of it. I don't know if I can give the whole thing, but I'll, I'll give some pieces. One is, I don't live in their world in order to have compassion towards them, uh, regardless. I don't have to sit at the bar and drink with them in order for them to know I'm compassionate towards them. I'm not going to meet them in the sewer. They're going to meet me in a heavenly place. And that doesn't mean church. That means my heaven. Does that make sense? So, and I, and I found that as a tool. It's not about, you know, yeah, you love, you love people. Jesus, he's going by, and he says to Zacchaeus, he said, come down, I'm going to eat in your house today. So he went to his house. And the biggest complaint they had about Jesus is that he ate with sinners. He hung around with sinners more than he hung around with righteous people. But it wasn't righteous people, it was religious people. And I'll tell you what, I'd rather, don't take this the wrong way, I'd rather be at the bar with a bunch of sinners than in a place with a bunch of religious people that don't have God. They're harder to reach than that person in the bar. 
But again, I don't have to sit at the bar and, and turn up a bunch of drinks or shots or whatever they do, shoot shots or however they say it. I don't have to do all that because I'm not good for anything after that. So you can forget about me being compassionate. I'm, I'm the best. And I'm a big lightweight, so that's even worse. So um, part of it is that you, you've got to understand where to pull the, draw the line. Uh, another part of this is you've got to understand where you are. Where are you in your walk with the Lord? Where is your maturity level with the Lord? Because sometimes, as, and I'm just going to say it like this, if we're baby Christians and we're, just, we're weak in ourselves in a lot of places, we're going to get sucked into their world versus pulling them out of their world. And so you've got to watch out. <clears throat> you've got to know where you are and, 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 and understand that. So there is some severing with friendships. Uh, I remember when I was in high school and got saved, I had to sever with friendships because they weren't going where I was going. And they didn't want anything to do with what I was getting. And I couldn't handle them. I couldn't help them. I couldn't draw them out unless they looked for me. One of my friends did. And I actually got him. He actually received the Lord. But then later he, went, he, went, he got derailed on his own. But he, he met the Lord through me because I dragged him along. He was a friend of mine. So that's what I meant by you bring them to your heavenly place instead of going to their sewer. Okay? So, and that, you've got to figure that out in each, in each instance. Uh, you know, there, there's just all kinds of situations. Um, there's some things, if I have little children, that I will not tolerate people being around. Uh, I can remember my father-in-law was an alcoholic. And uh, he didn't want to know anything about God, religion, any of it. And Darlene and I were saved. We lived in their home after we got married for a little while. And my father-in-law told me, he said, you will not preach in my house you keep your mouth shut about any of that stuff that was it but when he turned up a few he'd have his buddies come over the house and they'd have a big bunch of drunks in there he would talk like a drunk my father-in-law and I'd come in I remember coming in from work one day and he said Richard these people need God come here and sit down and tell them about God they need God and he wants me to preach while they're all drunk and I wouldn't do it. I just would walk through and just go on with my life because I couldn't handle that. I couldn't, there was nothing I could do. I can't get them out of their drunkenness. That that's not, they were partying. They were, they were in a different place. They didn't want God. That's just whatever. But you've got to, you've got to be able to discern some of that and be able to walk away from some things and embrace some things. Um, you know, there's, I have ungodly people in my life. I uh, meet them all the time. I make it a point to meet ungodly people because I think God wants to love the ungodly people. So I try to make it a point as a pastor even not to just be in these four walls. I try to make it a point to meet people outside of here and get in situations where I'm outside of these walls. And, and uh, I know what I carry, for one thing. If you start understanding what you carry, you can get in different situations. It doesn't have to be a bar. It doesn't have to be an orgy or something like that, right? It, it can be other situations. Like I, I'll get on a boat because I love diving and spearfishing. And I'll get on a boat with some of the guys. One or two of them are Christians. Most of them are not. And hey, I don't care. I'm out there fishing with them or spearfishing. And we're having a good time. And, and God's going to come out of me. It's not going to be in, in gospel form. It's not going to be a preaching, a message. But God's going to come out of me. And it's like, Something's different about this guy. And they'll just start opening up and just start asking about their life. And, and then I can speak to them. And they get drawn into my heaven, right? Because I'm present. So, so you look for those opportunities, but you don't want to create opportunities where it's going to get you in trouble. Yeah. Yeah.
you ask them, do you think God is powerful enough to heal you? And they go, oh, yeah, he's God. No, he, he is God. But you say, do you really think he wants to heal you? And they go, I'm not sure. And see, so what's so cool about it is when we start being in his hands, yeah. we actually can bust that barrier down in their life where they actually, through you, start to believe God actually wants to do it. You know, sometimes we kind of think it's our compassion, but we're actually, <laughs> using a bad word, we're channeling God's <laughs> compassion. You know, we're, we're, we're actually hooking into his, utilizing his, and then by doing that, we're actually allowing his compassion to touch them and allowing the power that we want. I mean, that's why I think we only need a little grain of mustard seed of faith. Because if we actually had the compassion, we, we don't need as much faith because the people's hearts and minds open. And they don't need very much because the compassion opens them wide open yeah. to allow his power to touch them. Does that make sense? Because, but if they're not sure, then we're trying to, we need more power, we need more power, when really, we need more compassion. Yeah. Exactly. Does that, does that make a little yeah, sense? Yeah, it does. And uh, along with that, I would say something that I practice is when I get around people, I'm always tuning into the Holy Spirit to show me behind the scenes. Because there's always a behind the scenes. There's what you get, but there's a behind the scenes. And when the Holy Spirit starts opening that up to me, that's when I start getting downloads from the Spirit of God. I start getting a vision or I start getting a word or I know that something's going to happen because God's showing me behind the scenes what's going on in their life. And it's like once you start tapping into that, that's, that's the compassion just moving towards people. You start tapping into it, you can actually start hurting with them. Even though they got a smile on their face, you can start hurting with them. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen through myself, through my, through my life, have been at times that I feel like I'm carrying something and it's just, it's painful on the inside. It's almost like I'm giving birth. I know that's, I'm not, I'm not a woman and my wife would say, stay away from that. But Paul said it, so I think I'm okay. He was, he was in pains of childbirth for churches, for people. And, and, and there, is, there is a burden that I've, I've had on my life. I'll, I'll go along and I'll pray. I'll be in a congregation and I'll start praying for people. And I'll look at somebody and, and the Holy Spirit will just come over me. And, and I can feel it, compassion rising up. And I, and I feel like I'm just going to double over in pain because of what I'm feeling for this person. And as I start releasing it, I can feel the virtue. You know, Jesus said one time, who touched me? When the lady came in, he actually felt virtue leave him. And I know, you know, we get all messed up. We start, well, that was the son of God. He was also the son of man. And he shows us a lot of things that we are to walk in. He set the example. And I've, I've sensed virtue go out. I've sensed it go through my body and touch people's lives when that, that pain is there and it just, it'll just be released. And I know some kind of tremendous miracle just happened in their life. I've seen people shake under the power of God from that. They'll just fall over and they'll get up and they're brand new. Something changed. There's a miracle that took place in their life. Or something got broken that was a demonic hold around them and it was broken never to come back. I mean, tremendous stuff. Tremendous stuff. So... Yeah, 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 they, ju they, they, tr they tr tried to get to the shadow, and they got healed just from the shadow. Yeah, it was amazing. So. About what happened? Yeah. So, yeah, what she's talking about is be able to move in that kind of faith that people were fighting to get in the shadow. So I want to share now as I finish and we'll move into something else what I saw while we were praying. The Lord just opened this up in my spirit as we were praying earlier before the service and I just, I, I held back. I, would, I didn't think I was supposed to pray it. I really believe it was a prophetic vision 
for what's getting ready to happen. And, and, and what I saw was the church coming of age where it was no longer the church, and I'm not talking about just us as a body, but no longer just us knowing God, but all of a sudden hunger woke up in the city and in the region, and the hunger started breaking things off of people's lives because they started going after what the church had with such a hunger that the power of God was released through the church like I've never seen it. It was just like this earthquake took place. And, and, and I saw this happening here. I believe it's going to happen with us, and I know it's going to happen in this region. There was just, it was like this awakening of people uh, that all of a sudden it was like they were no longer, they couldn't stay in the grave. They couldn't stay in the pit. They couldn't stay in the suffering. They couldn't stay in the dark place. All of a sudden they got a hold of something. Something came to them and they started going after that thing and going after the Lord. And we were the vessels carrying the message of God and the power of God started just lighting up all over the place. And I didn't feel that as just a little picture that I saw. I didn't feel like that was just a, man, God, I, that's cool to pray. I really felt like it was it, something shifted in my spirit. I felt like it was something, this is getting ready to be um, colossal. I don't know what other word to use. It's, just, it's getting ready to be big. It's, it's something, something's, something's a stir. As uh, was it Sherlock Holmes? Something's a foot, right? The, the game's afoot. Um, and I just, I could see it and I couldn't get it out of my spirit. And this is one of the ways I test things. When I, when I you know, you get a lot of pictures, you get a lot of things. And, and a lot of them are good. There's nothing wrong with them. But I don't act on a lot of the pictures that I get because my mind can make pictures. But sometimes I get things that I can't get rid of. I even try to get rid of them. I try to just throw it off, say, oh, that's nothing. And it's just there, and it, and it starts invading my life in all kinds of ways. And this was one of those visions. I could just see it, just it, it's there, and it's not going away. And I keep, every time I say it, or even now, I see it with more clarity that God's going to begin bringing people into a, li- a, a deliverance like never before. The, 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 the enemy is going to start being broken off of people's lives. Bondages and things are going to be broken off their life. We're going to start seeing... A major amount, even more than just creative miracles or, or, or regular healings, we're going to start seeing a major amount of deliverance and, and, and transformation coming in people's lives. There's going to be, it's going to be pronounced. That part's going to be pronounced more than a lot of other areas uh, because God is going to start bringing people into a place of wholeness where there's a restoration of family. There's a restoration of right and wrong in the midst of that. There's, there's, there's sons and daughters and parents, and it's going to start coming back together because so much has been lost, and, and it's like the frog in the frying pan. No one realizes how much has been lost, but all of a sudden there's going to be an awakening to what's missing, and they're going to start crying out for what's been missing, and God is going to answer it through his people. We're not getting ready for nothing. That's one of the things that I felt impressed even with this. And I've taught, I've taught this kind of stuff that I'm teaching right now. I've taught this for many, many, probably my whole ministry. Uh, and one of the things that, that I've said over and over again is you get filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, you start speaking in tongues, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a sweet experience. It's a beautiful experience. That's for you. That's for you. God's getting you cleaned up. God's getting you fixed. He's getting you in a better place. He, he's getting you to operate more in the Spirit and the things that He has for you. God's growing you up, Holy Spirit in you, doing all that. But there's another aspect. It's got to go beyond speaking in tongues and being filled with the Spirit. It's got to be the release of the Holy Spirit that pours out of us and brings it to the world around us. So there, there's, a, there's two levels. The problem in the church, I'm not saying here, I'm just saying in general what I have seen for decades, the problem in the church has been we've camped out at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we haven't moved to return from the wilderness in the power of God. And that's Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. 
Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And when he returned from being tempted after the 40 days, he returned in the power of God. He left in the fullness of the Spirit. He returned in the power of God. We haven't come to the place of returning in the power of God yet. But it's coming. Right. Overcoming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We need this, and I'm a proponent of church, meeting, coming together, being under the anointing. I, I love it. I believe it's an integral part of what we need to do. It builds you up, it helps you, it gets you in family, it gets you some protection, it etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I can go on and on. I could talk for hours and the importance of gathering as a people. There is something very important about it, whether that's in a small group or in a larger group. And I love more the dynamic that we have than having 1,000, 2,000 people where you can't get to know everybody. But I've done both. I've done big church, and I've done it as a little church because when you learn how to do family, it doesn't matter how many you are. There's always room at the table for more. There's always room at the table for more. It can be done because I've seen it, and I know it can be done. But everything can't be just this. There has to be the going out and coming back, like Jesus sent out the disciples. He sent out the 70. And it says they return. It says, Lord, even the demons are subject in your name. And Jesus said, don't rejoice over that, guys. That's just normal Christianity 101. That's just, that's just supposed to happen. Don't get, don't get all worked up over that. Rejoice in your salvation. But see... We've got to get to that place where we're going out and people are being touched in whatever we're doing, whatever atmosphere we're in. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy in the world. You know that? But God's still bigger than all that. And he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Okay? All right, I'm going to shift real quick. You might have more questions, but I've got to shift. Because the Spirit of God's on me. Lee, I've got I to gotta minister to you. I just, I'm getting messed up just looking at you. Uh, God's, God's been, he's, he's just taking things, and he's pulling out this and pulling out that and pulling out the other. It's like he's taking it all out because the puzzle was put together with the wrong pieces in the wrong places. And he's putting the pieces back into the perfect puzzle inside of you. And he's and he's and he's been work. You know he's been working on stuff, but he's but he is working, and you're starting to feel this process. You're starting to feel it coming together. It's starting to tighten up and come into place, to where now you're going to start enjoying the fruit, the joy, the peace of God in a greater way than you than you have in a long time, because you've been messing with frustration. You've been messing with with you've been messing. It's just, it's, can I say it? You've been a mess. And listen, this is, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is all over you. And, and he's not been leaving you. You've, you've been a mess and he's not been leaving you. He's there and he's putting this thing together. And it's going to be so beautiful that you won't, uh, you won't recognize yourself. You're not going to recognize yourself. You're going to stop coming down on Leah. Leah. You're going to stop messing with God's daughter. You're going, to, you're going to stop telling her all that she's done wrong and all this stuff that she's not gotten right. You're going to, you're going to, all that's coming to an end. You hear me? And I'm, I'm being a little bit bold because I feel really strong about this. There's the power of God's coming on your life, and this is, this is life-changing right now. You're, you're going to come into a place where God is going to let you see you the way he sees you. And you're no longer going to see Leah the way she was. She's gone. She's done. And there's a new Leah. 
And God has made her. And God's made you perfect. God's made you who you're supposed to be. And all you need to do is be. You don't need to struggle anymore. You don't, you don't need to be trying to fight to be something else. You don't need to try to fight to be the perfect mom or be the perfect wife or be the perfect daughter. You just need to be who God's called you to be. And God's power, His virtue is going to start flowing through you and it is going to be beautiful. I'm, I'm telling you right now that your, literally your countenance is going to change because of what the Spirit of God is doing on you right now and will continue to do in the next months. I know that was good. I know that was good. I just, I, I'm telling you, I feel there's, there are certain times that I just get a real strong impression, and that was, that was one of those that I can't get it off of me. I mean, God, God's working, and He's changing something so deep that you're never going to have to suffer there again. It's, I can see it coming out. It's been deep in there, and, and I can see God just pulling it out. He's just taking it out. And as he's pulling it out, he's sewing up behind it. So there's not, nothing's going to be left. It's going to be totally removed. I hope you recorded that. It's all recorded. Because you, you need to live in that word for a little while. And I, I, I'm sorry Justin wasn't here, but I'll pick on him at another time. Um, the first time that his teacher saw him kind of rear back to bang his head on the ground because he didn't get what he wanted, she snatched him up, brought him to a mirror, and she said, you will not hurt Griffin. And he never did it again. And um, I really believe exactly what Richard's saying, that God is going to bring you into a mirror where you're going to see yourself in a way that you never have before, and you're going to see yourself for who you are, and that is who God has created you to be, and it's perfect, and you... You will not even have any desire to come down on yourself for anything anymore. And you will not want to hurt Leah. Oh, was that all right for us to share that? I didn't ask permission. I, I got overwhelmed. But um, it's stuff, sometimes we just carry stuff and we don't even know what we're carrying. Rhonda, I'm going to wait because I want, I want Andy to be here to minister to you. I, I feel like I'm supposed to minister a word over, over both of you. So I'm going to hold, um, but I'm going to give you a, a little preview. Um, the trailer, the trailer. But man, there's deep water inside of you. There's God's there. It's deeper than you've ever realized. You, you've got more of God than you think you've got. Uh, it, it, the stream, the river runs deep. And, and the Lord wants you to know that, that you, you're on, you're on a, you're on a higher level than you've ever put yourself, especially in the Lord. And, and you have words of wisdom when you speak and you see things that others don't see. And, uh, and, and God's using that, and he has used it, and he's going to use it even more. And I'll hold off on <clears throat> more until I can grab Andy, too. Because I know he's going to get mad. He said, what? So just tell him we, d we did the preview. I know. I, I, I sensed that. So I'm kind of like, I need, to, I need to hold back on part of it and, and get him in, in the mix. And mess him up a little bit too. I, you know, I, I, I mean, Darlene and I, when we started out, we were so close. Everything we experienced in God, we did together. And even prophetic words that I would receive, she was with me in those prophetic words. 
And a lot of that has happened over the years. And I, and I always wanted her to be present when things like that would happen in my life because it, you can't, it's hard to repeat it. You know, it's just hard. You can't recreate the moment. It's like, yeah, they gave me this word. Okay, great. But in the moment, it's a lot different, and I know it is, and that's why I just try to be obedient. I, I feel like, and I forgot your name, Randy. Randy. Um, <clears throat> tears. I just keep seeing tears. Uh, a lot of tears. And they're not just tears. I don't even think there a lot of them are tears for you. I think they're tears for others. And, and, and it's just been, there's a river of that compassion in you and just looking at people and caring so much about people and wanting them to do well, to be well, uh, that you've cried. You've, you've cried enough where God said, sister, I want you to come up here. Daughter, I want you to come up here. And he's pulling you into the throne room. And he's pulling you closer to him. And, and I believe that God is on you to reveal his heart for people. He's sharing with you, and he will share with you secrets as you come before the Lord, because you are a true prayer warrior. Uh, you're, a, you're a true, uh, I would say, if this makes sense, a virgin before the Lord, bringing, bringing to the Lord incense and bringing to the Lord just, just bringing those prayers and, and, and tears before the Lord. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I just I just really got that sense. You're a crier. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. You're welcome. It's a gift. Thank you, Lord. I think there is. Yeah. I think there's something in there. I'm not quite sure how it says it. We'll look it up. <laughs> we'll, we'll look it up. No, they're not. It's tr it's a true word. It's not it's not a made up fairy tale. <laughs> Praise God. Um, did you have anything? I'm getting carried away. No, not at all. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Kyle. Did you have anything after two? Okay. Well, um, I, I don't know who you are. I never met you before, but... Give us your name. Mike? Okay. Hey, Mike. Um, the Lord was showing me is that you, you look like Newt Gingrich. And he told me that you are, you are a speaker of the house. Okay. That you are a speaker of the house, and when, when you speak, people need to listen. And they haven't listened always, but they need to. Because you have the mind of the Lord, you have, you have the word of the Lord, you have wisdom from him. You see things that a lot of times people don't see. And the Lord is trying to speak through you to others and to situations and to places, departments, people, things, but they're not listening to you. But the Lord wants to change that. So he says, don't give up. Don't shy back. That is from him. He has given you this. You need to move forward, but ask him for wisdom as you go forward. Be sure you're doing it in his time and in his spirit with his compassion, okay? Because it's hard sometimes to have compassion in, in what you're moving in and what you're dealing with, but he's going to work some things out and to give you the right words and also change some people's minds, okay? That it's gonna be supernatural, okay? It's, you're gonna know it's him when it happens okay 
Amen. All right. And I don't know your name over, right? Right there. Um, show me, you're, you're a seer. You, you're really sensitive. You're more sensitive in the spirit than you think you are. That you actually um, can feel things very deeply. You can hear him. And he wants to use you in that way. He, he says you have a very special gifting and you'll be able to see things as well as have dreams and, and function in this a little bit more than you ever had before. And there's something that he's dropped into you, a gifting like that, and he wants you to call out for it. I mean, he wants you to seek it. He wants you to seek him. He wants all of us to seek him. But especially in this area because it's going to be something that is going to be very helpful to a lot of people. And it's going to be really great for you because when it happens, you're going to feel this connection with God that you've never had before, okay? It's going to be something that's going to be really cool. So I think what's coming up in my spirit is don't shy away from it. Don't think it's not for you. Don't think, well, I don't I never thought about that because he, he, he does want to do this. And, and, and I'm kind of like the little seed. I'm just, he wants to throw a little seed in there. And then all of a sudden, I think you're going to come back somewhere along the line and say, you know, he, I think he's starting to do this in me. But, but you have to have the first seed, the, the first thing that kind of says, that could be possible, and that's something I could really function in, okay? But it's going to be really cool. It's going to be something that you're really going to love as far as what it's going to do with your relationship with him, okay? All right. And uh, I don't know if I got anything else. That might be it. All right. Well, how are we doing? Everybody good? Um, yeah, I think we'll stop. Not because the Holy Spirit left. Uh, we'll continue. Uh, you're teaching next Tuesday, right? Or is it? No, you're teaching the following. We're actually going to have, many of you probably don't know him well yet. Part of, they've been part of our body for a little while. Mark and Sarah Rommel. He's actually uh, works as a chaplain at the uh, women's prison. And uh, he's going to share next Tuesday. I think it's going to be really good. So don't, you don't want to miss that. I think he's going to have a good word. And, uh, and I like him. I mean, he's, he'll be powerful. He'll be good. And uh, so come and enjoy that. And uh, David will be there here the following Tuesday. I will be in Mexico with my wife. We're leaving Thursday and uh, going to be in a bunch of our churches that we actually founded and raised up. And so we'll be with a lot of our spiritual children from all those years and looking forward to a great time. My schedule will be very full. I'll preach almost every day, if not every day, for the next two weeks, at least once. And... Uh, eat some good food in between, spend time with friends. But we'll have a good time. We'll go from 4,500 elevation down to zero elevation, back up to 3,000, back down to zero. Um, it's a very, changes very quickly in that area where we live, the region. It's part of the rainforest. Parts of it are. So anyway, just keep us in prayer over the next weeks and... Uh, don't miss because I'm not here. It's going to be good. You don't want to miss what God's going to do. There's tremendous things going to happen. Kyle's going to share. Uh, David Hart's is going to share. Different ones have got the, everything going on. And uh, I expect there would be absolutely zero problems in my absence. <laughs> and it's like, I know God will do that. He'll do that for me. <laughs> But anyway, um, just be believing God with us. I believe that God's going to move mightily in miracles and uh, a lot of deliverance for people. I believe we'll see a lot of salvation as well. I have high expectation what God's been showing me is going to happen already. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to our time. And it's the first time we've been out, well, like this for ministry. I went last year once to Mexico to help a pastor that was 
uh, had a stroke and help his church. And I ended up, I went just to be with him and I ended up preaching in three churches and I was only going just to be there. They weren't even meeting in person. It was in the middle of COVID and I still preached in three different churches. I don't know how this stuff happens. It's just God. So um, just be praying for me because I, I could tell you my schedule, but it changes every day. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll have a good time. I'll share with when we get back. And God bless you. Have a great night. Greet somebody. And uh, 